Thank you. Uh, well, just by way of a uh, quick introduction. So my name is David Bradburn. I am the Vice President of Global Sales for Humanware, a manufacturer of technology for people who are blind or have low vision. And uh, I'm joined today by Dr. Alexis Malkin. Um, Dr. Malkin and I have presented uh, once before, as Catherine mentioned. And uh, the, uh, the theme for today, of course, is going to still be on low vision. That's our area of specialization. But we're also going to be touching on the issues of funding and just how do, uh, how do some of the products like the ones that Humanware makes, but certainly uh, including others in the industry, how are they typically uh, provided? Uh, you will notice when we start this slide that although we are talking in kind of very broad terms, there are some situations where we are specifically talking about Massachusetts. The reason for that, very simple uh, reason, is that Dr. Malkin and myself are both in the Boston area. And so we tend to know more about Massachusetts where we live than other states where we don't. So with that, Dr. Malkin is actually going to lead us through the first set of slides. So um, I'll hand over to her and she can perhaps introduce herself a little bit more fully than I did. Thanks, uh, Lexi. You're muted, by the way. I think there you go. Perfect. No, oh, should be unmuted and hopefully the slides are showing up. Yes. Yeah, we see the slide. Perfect. And I know someone had a question in the chat about the opening code. So that is face F A C E. Um, so thank you, David and APH for hosting this webinar once again. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Dr. Malkin. I am faculty at New England College of Optometry, and my primary focus area is in low vision rehabilitation. Um, so I see patients of all ages at a variety of clinic sites in uh, Boston and the surrounding areas. Um, I've been practicing since 2008 and have done both residency and fellowship training in this area. So we're gonna go through some cases today, and then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. So just some notes, um, please save your questions till the end. If you have a burning question and you don't want to forget it, you can put it in the chat box, either the general or the private chat, and we will do our best to answer all of the questions in the time that we have. And um, you can see on our map here that we have our little star for Massachusetts. So. This is where we're based. Some of the things that I talk about in the cases may be very specific to our region. So you'll need to check with your local jurisdictions on their specific requirements and on the principles that may apply there. But hopefully these will be generalizable cases and um, presentation points for you. So just as a point of introduction, I think based on the polling, everyone here understands that vision impairment is a spectrum. Uh, but I always like to emphasize that when I start a presentation. So the cases I'm going to be talking about will be from that spectrum. So some patients have more mild to moderate vision loss. And some people that I work with are totally blind, have no light perception. The vast majority of people who are categorized as having vision impairment do have residual usable vision. It's very rare that someone is bilaterally no light perception or can't see even light in both eyes. Uh, most people have some residual vision and that is has varying degrees of usability for them. Um, additionally, most states provide services for people who are legally blind. Uh, legal blindness falls in the mid range of that spectrum, but many states also serve patients with better vision than legal blindness. So that will be very state specific um, and also country specific, as I saw that we have some people from Canada and we have some people from Greece and from other places. So you'll, you'll want to know what the agencies that you work with um, can do and who they can serve. So when we think about Massachusetts specifically, who qualifies here and how do they get state services? What is the funding available to them and how do they get the services that they need? So in Massachusetts, everybody who is legally blind by the social security definition, qualifies for services through the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. 
Um, I know that this slide is probably going to raise some questions. We'll talk about this in more detail at the end if those questions come up. But the official social security definition of legal blindness as of 2007 is worse vision than 2100, best corrected in the better seeing eye. It's not 2200, it is worse than 2100. In addition, someone can be qualified as legally blind based on their visual field. And that would mean a visual field that is smaller than 20 degrees um, at maximum extent in the better seeing eye. So if you have either one of those things in Massachusetts, you automatically qualify to be registered with the Commission for the Blind and to receive services. The level of service, uh, there are some nuances, but anyone who meets that social security definition is eligible. In addition, Massachusetts has a, a requirement that states that individuals where standard acuity testing is impossible, but the patient functions as legally blind, they are eligible for services. So these may be patients who have multiple disabilities, who are nonverbal, or who are unable to do standard testing after a brain injury, a stroke, something like that. Uh, this does require a doctor's certification that they truly believe that that patient functions as legally blind. It's not something we use a lot, but it's something that is really, really valuable to our patients to be able to register them, even if they can't perform a standard acuity test. And then finally, in Massachusetts, the Vocational Rehabilitation Program serves people with vocational goals who are visually impaired and who are likely to progress to legal blindness. So visual impairment in this particular case is defined as worse than, 20, excuse me, 2070 or worse, or an 80 degree or smaller field. So a little bit more generous than the standard legal blindness definition but the key is that it needs to be a progressive condition. And what happened here is that Massachusetts recognized the significant need that people with progressive conditions have before they end up legally blind, especially those adults who are working. And so they've expanded their service provision, particularly in areas like mobility and vocational rehabilitation for this group of people. In other states, visual impairment is automatically served. So when we talk about state services and we talk about the types of things that can be provided both through state agencies as well as private rehabilitation centers, uh, people can receive vocational rehabilitation. So either learning strategies to maintain the job that they have or job skills or educational training to change careers or establish a career. People can receive school-based accommodations in, conduct, in conjunction with their IEP team so that individualized education program through the school system. These accommodations are for people who are um, from age three to age 22. Prior to age three, someone would receive early intervention services. And after age 22, if they age out of the school system, they would shift into either rehab services, commission for the blind services, whatever it's called in your particular jurisdiction. Individuals will learn independent living skills uh, through rehab teaching or occupational therapy. There's orientation and mobility training, assistive technology training, social work, and many, many more services depending on the individual's goals and needs. So when we think about what assistive technology is, um, it can include a lot of different categories. So we'll talk about some particular technologies and how they worked in the cases today, but they can include video magnification, uh, I have a number of photos here of different types of video magnifiers, both portable, transportable, and desktop. They can include head-mounted displays like the VR headset on the bottom of the screen here. Assistive technology can include computer software, general computer accessibility, as well as smartphones, tablets, and the apps that can be put onto those devices. So now that we've laid down the foundation of the terms that we're using and what all of this means, let's talk about some different case examples. And these are stock photos, they're not photos of the patients. Um, but these are all patients that I've seen in the last few months. So it can 
show you that these are very realistic patients and situations and how people were able to access services. So in this first case example, it was a 38 year old female who came in for a low vision exam. She stated that she had not had a formal low vision assessment in many years and she felt that she was overdue for that. She had an ocular history that was significant for a congenital vision impairment. So she was born with her vision impairment and it is secondary to optic nerve hypoplasia as well as nystagmus in both eyes. Her best corrected visual acuity measured 20 over 400 in her right eye and she had no light perception vision in her left eye. So she's right in the middle of that spectrum that I described. And this level of visual acuity qualifies her as legally blind by the social security definition. Her chief complaint when she came in for her exam with me was that she felt that she had a significant change in her functionality at work since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, we're seeing a lot of cases like this where work requirements have changed and someone who is really well adapted to their vision now has to kind of shift how they're doing things. So in terms of her vocational history, we always wanna probe that further when she said she struggled at work. Um, she is a medical provider at a community health center here in the greater Boston area. Her health center has shifted her visits to be primarily through telehealth and her electronic medical record system is being accessed through a remote environment. So she's not able to just log on directly to her computer. She has to go through a remote environment for the security needed to get into the telehealth system. She is typically a ZoomText computer accessibility software user, and that had been working for her very, very well. But ZoomText can't be loaded onto that remote environment and it was not working well in terms of compatibility with what she needed to magnify. In addition, she just felt like generally her efficiency has reduced over time. So we always ask patients, in addition to this vocational history, you know, what other devices are you using besides the software she had mentioned? Perhaps there's a way we can use one of those devices to accomplish another goal. Um, so she has a monocular telescope. She doesn't use it very much right now because she is working remotely, but previously it was used for public transportation to see which bus was coming and those types of things. And then she's using Zoom text software, only the screen magnification. She's not using speech output at the present time. During the low vision exam, we did a number of other tests to identify exactly what was going on. So we assessed the patient with, um, for a refraction, she didn't have any glasses change and that 2400 was truly the best corrected vision we could get her. But she did note a significant improvement in her spot reading or her quick you know, checking of numbers and information with a portable video magnifier or CCTV. And she felt like that could be really beneficial for work because she often, gets a printout with some information that she would just need to check really quickly before shifting over to the EMR. So our plan at that point in time, um, after an extensive discussion about her needs and her goals, was that we wanted to reactivate her case with the Commission for the Blind. Because she was gainfully employed and doing well, the Commission had closed her as a successful case closure, but they are always willing to reopen a case when somebody has new goals, vision changes or new challenges at work. So we encouraged her to reach out to the commission and we reached out from our end as well. We set her up with an assistive technology consultation and assessment. We saw her a month later for follow-up and she reported that as we had discussed in the visit, adding speech output to her Zoom text was going to be beneficial. The commission worked with her and taught her how to use the speech features and she found it really helpful. In addition, the assistive technology team made some modifications to the visual setup that she was using at home, and they provided her with a larger dual monitor system. This was allowing her to zoom in to that remote environment a lot more easily and to not have to worry so much about the compatibility of Zoom text. So those two modifications that they made very quickly 
really improved her efficiency at work. In addition, um, the commission was able to get her a portable CCTV and much like she thought during our visit, it is really helpful for her for spot reading, both work related and for um, tasks around the house. In this particular case, um, the patient was provided all services at no cost to her because of the specific qualifications for her support through the vocational rehabilitation program. Um, not everyone receives all services at no cost but in her case, based on the assessment that was done internally at the commission, she was able to get these new devices and these services and training at no cost to her. So that's one example of a way that funding can go and how you can use some of these technologies to address a person's goals. In this second case, it's a little bit different. Um, so this is a 45-year-old who has choroideremia who came in for a follow-up low vision exam with me. He has worked with the Commission for the Blind in the past, much like the other patient. He had um, a closed case at the time that he came to see me. He is not able to work because he has multiple disabilities in addition to his vision impairment. So he is on social security disability and does not feel that his health will allow him to work, even though he's technically a vocational age. From his past services at the commission, he has received mobility training, some devices and independent living training, and he felt like those were really helping him accomplish a lot of his goals. He has a desktop CCTV at home, as well as an Android phone where he has made some modifications to the contrast, as well as to the size of the materials that he's reading. So we wanted to probe that history a little bit further and find out what else he was potentially struggling with. Um, so he mentioned that he had significant glare sensitivity with computer and TV viewing, and he spends a lot of his day doing those two things. Those are major hobbies of his. And he stated that really that was his main goal. That was what brought him in to see me was he felt like there should be a better tool to help address the glare. Um, he didn't have anything that was really working. And he wanted to be able to play video games. That's a social outlet for him as somebody who has restricted mobility, both from the vision as well as from the health concerns. Uh, he uses the chat features in these video games and it's a really nice social outlet. So he wanted to be able to do that more easily. Generally, he feels like his level independ of independence with his mobility and his daily living is good. And it's not that he wants to go out more, he just wants to be able to use the social outlets that are comfortable for him. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the commission had provided the desktop CCTV, so he was able to manage his mail, his bills, and his other necessary reading. So in terms of his clinical findings, um, he was best corrected to 20 over 400 in each eye. So again, kind of mid-range, but does qualify as legally blind, which makes sense since he gets commission services. He did not have an improvement with an updated refraction at that visit. We know he already does well with video magnification, so we didn't go into a whole lot of testing related to that. Um, and instead, we assessed the patient with a head-mounted display. Um, in this particular case, it was the iris vision. And he really liked it to see the computer screen without any glare symptoms. So he had tried some of the built-in accessibility, the modifications to the computer screen, but he was still getting glare from the ambient light around him. This particular type of head-mounted display is a closed system. And so it blocks all of the light from the sides above and below, in addition to allowing him to adjust the brightness on the device to limit the light coming into his eyes from the computer screen. And he really liked it, was really comfortable with what he could see and how, how things looked in terms of playing video games. So now that we know what works for him, um, what are our next steps? How do we help him get the device that he wants to achieve his goals? So initially we sent a report to the Commission for the Blind. He is registered with them, um, although his case was not active. And we placed a request for the Iris Vision headset. Unfortunately, in this particular case, he has a CCTV. He is achieving the goals related to independent living, 
Um, and he doesn't have specific vocational goals to use that Iris Vision headset. He also really couldn't come up with anything in terms of his independent living where he would use it. It was really for social purposes. So MCB was not able to find the funding to provide this particular device based on the fact that he didn't have vocational or independent living goals with it. Um, the patient does have insurance and we submitted a prior authorization to the insurance to request the device. And we provided as much justification as we could about his glare sensitivity, but the request was denied because they determined that it was not considered medically necessary for him to have these social engagements. Um, I would argue that socialization is incredibly important to somebody's health, but I, I did not win that argument with the commission at that particular time or with his insurance company. So my next step was to approach the local Lions Club and present the patient's case. Um, I felt really strongly that this device was going to make a very big difference in this person's quality of life. And I understood where the state agency and the insurance were not able to justify it, but I still felt like there should be other steps to take. So the Lions Clubs didn't have the funding just sitting in their account ready to purchase the device, but they liked the patient's story and they agreed that this would be something worthwhile for them to help, um, help obtain. And they actually organized a fundraiser to obtain the device for the patient. Um, this is a patient I saw pre-COVID. So the Lions Club organized a spaghetti dinner and in one evening raised everything that needed to be raised to purchase this device that was a few thousand dollars. Uh, the patient was ecstatic when he received it, and he still uses it on a daily basis. Um, his mother actually came with him to the follow-up visit. Uh, even though he's in his 40s, she was so interested to see what this device was that he had told her about. And uh, when she came to that follow-up, she told us that it was truly life-changing, that his well-being, his mood, and his affect had dramatically changed once he obtained the device. So we were really excited to find a way to get this device for the patient. He was not able to purchase it on his own. Um, like I said, we tried the state agency, we tried the health insurance. Sometimes those do work for this type of device. Uh, but in this case, we went to the Lions Club and they were incredibly supportive and helpful. And for our final case example, um, this is an eight-year-old who I saw who had labors hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, and he came in for his low vision exam, that's the theme. He was recently registered as legally blind with the commission by his ophthalmologist who follows him as well. He does have an IEP, that individualized education program in place at school. And the primary goal, he didn't have anything specific he was concerned with, but the parents wanted to know how to help him maximize his function both at school and at home. So in terms of his functional history, much like many pediatric patients with low vision, uh, he likes to use a close working distance for all tasks. So he holds materials very close to his eyes. His parents and the patient reported good mobility in familiar places. And although he doesn't have any current low vision devices at school, he does use an iPad at home and he really likes the iPad. It's easy for him to enlarge and it's easy for him to get that close working distance. At his low vision exam, his best corrected vision was 2200 in each eye, and he had very severe contrast sensitivity loss, a bit more severe than expected based on his age, even with the diagnosis of optic neuropathy. We measured his working distance, and he was able to read very small print at that 10 centimeter working distance. So we wanted to see what would work for this particular patient in terms of low vision devices uh, to find out was there more that could be helpful besides the close working distance in the iPad. So I actually looked at a monocular telescope to see his response and see how he would do for distance spotting. And he did really, really well. We started with a two and a half X telescope, a bit lower power than what he'll ultimately need, but to gauge how he could localize objects, how he could focus it, and see if that is something that his vision teacher and mobility instructor can begin to integrate, knowing that ultimately based on his vision, we're gonna end up at probably a four or a six X telescope once he gets comfortable. In addition, he can read small print, age appropriate print at that 10 centimeter working distance, 
but I wanted to see if I could get him to maintain a slightly longer working distance and not have to strain so much. So I looked at a dome magnifier. Most of these are kind of a standard 4X power, though it depends on how close he gets to it, how much effective power he gets. But he really liked it for near spotting. He, th he thought he would keep it in his backpack and use it when print was small. He does have a vision teacher in the school system. The parents were able to share that detail of the IEP. And he has an orientation and mobility instructor. So he was really well connected to services. The parents felt comfortable with his IEP. They felt like he was really getting good services and were just curious what else might be helpful. So we wrote up his report and just added the recommendations to begin exploring that monocular telescope as well as the dome magnifier for near spotting. The teacher of the visually impaired was able to help obtain those devices and provide them for him through the school system. Um, so a little bit different way to go about the funding, even though he's registered with the commission, he qualified for funding through his school system to be able to get these devices to use at school and then he can take them home to do his homework. So three different cases and um, different tools, different things that are used. But I think the key take homes here are that patients of all different ages and stages of vision loss can benefit from low vision exams and updated recommendations. As you saw, the first case had a congenital vision impairment, had really been doing well, uh, but had never even seen a portable CCTV because it had been such a long time since she had had a low vision assessment. So in addition to the new work goals, we helped address some of her other goals and showed her some new technology. Um, so each patient may have that new goal. And I try to see my patients at least once a year. Uh, some I'll stretch out to every two years and some I see quite a bit more frequently depending on where they are in their journey with vision loss. And each of these cases had different ways that devices were obtained. So you really need to think creatively about the funding opportunities available to help your patients get what is prescribed. It's important to tell the story to emphasize the changes in quality of life and what the specific tools will be used for to make sure that you are optimizing what can help the patient get what they're looking for to achieve those particular goals. And even if one organization says it doesn't fit within their typical funding mechanism, there are a lot of other organizations and ways that you can connect your patients. And as we um, go on to connecting to other funding, I'm actually gonna turn this over to David to talk about other funding opportunities. And then I will um, open it up to questions at the end. Absolutely, great. Thank you very much, Lexi. Uh, okay, so as we segue then to another area of funding, we wanna speak about some of the federal funding that has become available in the United States during the course of the last 12 months uh, of the COVID pandemic. Um, there are various acronyms for these different programs. Um, some you may have heard of and some you may not have done. The most recent or the newest one is ARPA. So this is the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. Um, it is approximately 14 times bigger than any other federal fund that has come before in the past 12 months, and they've all been huge. Um, you might have heard of the CARES Act, that's the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic uh, Security Act. There's ESSER, which is the Elementary and Secondary School uh, Emergency Act. There's GEAR, which is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief, and HEAR, H-E-E-R, it is the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. All of these funds are, are, are all new within the last 12 months. Uh, one of the things though that's very significant about ARPA, which is the kind of the uh, general acronym we're using for this, uh, is that one third of the uh, allocated funds must be used to address or otherwise reduce learning loss uh, which has impacted all students um, probably around the world, but certainly here in the US, it's, it's, uh, it's um, impacted uh, students, but more so those with um, disability and uh, specifically improving access for students who are blind or low vision is all inside the law. 
um, terms like assistive technology uh, is used multiple times in the uh, ARPA uh, document, the law. And, um, and you may or may not know uh, how much money has uh, been provided to your local education authority. Um, the amounts vary, of course, by district and indeed by state. Uh, some districts, uh, certainly some of the larger ones, I would say one of some of the top 50 size districts in the country, uh, including those in states like New York, Florida, Texas, and California, have received uh, amounts over $1 billion. It is, a, uh, it is really a significant amount of money. Uh, we at Humanware have been learning a lot about ARPA and how it can be used. And we have introduced um, uh, information that we have shared uh, with educational um, customers around the country. We are helping them to put together what essentially amounts to being a wish list um, of technology solutions that can help their students who are blind or those with low vision. Uh, and in the typical conversations that we're having, we're not just talking about one device for one student. We're literally getting everyone to, to dream big because the, the money that's here right now with funds like ARPA are going to be around for at least the next two years. It's more money than districts have ever seen. Um, but uh, in, in any event, whether it's um, braille printers for blind students who read braille, refreshable braille displays, braille note takers, electronic video magnification devices, like some of the ones that Dr. Malkin was, was talking about earlier, uh, they all qualify. Um, and since the law specifically states that assistive technology can be purchased with these funds, uh, it's all good. So uh, Lexi, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Thank you. So there are some different areas where these funds can be used. Uh, so instructional plans to reduce learning loss is, is certainly the biggest. And I think that while we've had students learning from home in a hybrid or just a kind of a virtual classroom model, uh, reducing that learning loss is huge. Uh, providing the technologies then that can help make curriculum accessible. So whether that's a braille device that is taking an electronic PDF uh, textbook and displaying it in braille for a blind student, or a closed circuit television that is able to display that same PDF file in large print, and perhaps even speak the text that's on the page. Uh, these are all examples of technologies that can bring that access. Uh, and of course, even though many school districts, including uh, some in Massachusetts, have been returning at different rates of speed uh, back into the classroom, hybrid learning is, is still going on in some parts of the country, at least those that are still open. Several of the Southern states have already closed for the summer. Um, so being able to have tools that work both at home as well as in school is important. So at this point, what we're going to do, actually, um, Lexi, if you'd like to stop sharing, I'm going to uh, actually share my screen. So I want to show everybody something here. Okay, if it worked, what, uh, what everyone is now seeing is the Humanware webpage. So if you, if you are interested in this and you are an educator or perhaps you're a parent and you're interested in just learning more to in turn pass along to your child's TVI or special education department to let them know about it, uh, just remember to come to humanware.com. There is usually a rotating banner on the homepage that changes from one thing to another, but uh, one of the ones you're going to see is this one that's talking about taking advantage of ARPA funding to invest in adaptive technology. And if we click on that banner or select it, it will actually take you to a, a micro site, as we call it. So this is humanware.com forward slash ARPA funding. I'll add this link to the chat window uh, when I'm done here. Let me go ahead and copy it before I forget. And basically what we see here 
uh, this is uh, this is also a brochure. So this is something that we can send to people by email. But it basically kind of goes into some of the detail. We mentioned um, that the newest fund is ARPA. You heard me say that just a few minutes ago. And we mentioned some of the other funds that exist. We let you know uh, what you need to know about this funding, uh, some examples of how it can be used. And as we as we move to the, the second page of this brochure, uh, we, we again give examples in, a, in an educational setting of kind of what we mean. And at the, at the end of here, uh, of this, this page, uh, we have the toll-free phone number for humanware. So uh, if you are an educator working with students who are blind or have low vision, or if you're a parent of a child who is blind or low vision, and you would like to know more, or you'd like to have someone else learn more about it, you can call us by at this phone number or send us um, a message through our contact form. And we have specialists on hand who, uh, no obligation to anybody, will be more than happy to, uh, to speak with you, answer your questions. And uh, in the case of, um, of educators, we'll be happy to discuss with you a proposal that might work for your district and the students that you are serving. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it really isn't that hard. Uh, unlike some of the other federal or even state funds that might be available to departments like special education, there isn't any special application that you need to fill out. Once the, once the funds actually arrive with the local education authority, uh, it, is, it is incumbent upon you, the educators, to basically put in your, your requests. And we're doing this already. There are, there are many districts out in the Western part of the US that we're already working with, helping them put together uh, uh, proposals that can then be taken to your special ed department administrator, so the director of special education. Perhaps you have someone uh, associated with federal and state funding in your, in your school or district. Uh, we're, we're happy to work with, with them. And, and to then let them present their ideas, uh, you know, higher up. There's more money here than, than your districts are going to know what to do with. Um, so I don't think there's any need for anyone to feel embarrassed or guilty that somehow you're asking for, for too much. Um, you know, invariably, and I've been in this industry now for over 35 years, and I know that invariably, you know, we're, we're focused on one child and, and the, you know, sometimes stuff gets turned down because we feel like their needs are already being met by some existing piece of technology. This is an opportunity though for districts to equip themselves not only for the tasks at hand currently, so addressing learning loss with students, but also being prepared for the coming years. So it's a great, great opportunity. So let me stop it right there. I'm going to paste that link into the chat window just so it's there and I won't forget it. And, uh, and now we can turn to questions. Um, so I'm just there gonna- is, As I say, I can read, um, there's a question that came through, uh, I think for you, it's, um, is ARPA funding limited to a certain age of student? For example, college student up to 26 years old or are adults included too? It's a great question. So ARPA is an umbrella uh, under which there are several different funds. So if you're an adult student in higher education, then actually the fund called HEER, H-E-E-R, that was the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, would actually apply. In that case, if I were an adult student, I would be reaching out to the D Disabled Student Services Department at my college or university, uh, or, or any other kind of guidance counselor if I'm doing adult education through a public school. Um, and so that's what you do there. But certainly for everybody else uh, in, in, in K-12 education, I don't know that it necessarily needs to be um, public. Uh, there are different funds for private schools as well, uh, but you would simply be working through the special education department to the extent that you're not already working with a uh, teacher of the visually impaired. Let's see, let's scroll up. There were a couple of other questions I saw coming in. Yeah, and then um, there's a question about preschool as well. Yes. Um, 
So I actually, that's a good question. I've not actually been asked about preschool before because I realize that doesn't always exist as a program in every state. Uh, I would imagine though that ARPA would, would cover a preschool program since it is uh, for the most part a public offering. Um, and I'm, I'm not seeing so much a question as much as a statement from someone that's saying that they have an AT funding guide for Texas. Uh, and they've provided an email address in the chat window that people can see. But if someone's on the phone and can't see it, I'll be happy to read it out. But it's TBP, uh, that's Tango Bravo Papa, dot services at tsl.texas.gov. So you can email that address to get an AT funding guide. I do know that in Texas, there was an announcement from the governor of Texas in the past six weeks uh, letting everyone know that, I forget the number, it was like $1.4 billion or something like that, had already been handed out to the local education authorities in Texas. So Texas is an example of a state where the money is already with the LEAs. Um, I know that that is true of uh, Arizona. I know that in California, the allocation amounts have been announced already. The money just simply hasn't gotten into the uh, into the coffers, as it were, of the uh, LEAs, but the money is coming. Um, and so we do have, by the way, uh, access to different sites that can tell us uh, how much money has been allocated or will be allocated to an LEA in, I think, essentially any state in the USA. So no matter where you're from, uh, again, I would encourage you to, uh, to contact us and we'll be more than happy to provide you with as much information as we can find. And then, so someone, the person asking about preschool was asking about a braille printer because the student will need it long-term. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that seems like an appropriate justification. Totally. I mean, even explaining yeah. that it, even early in braille education, I think it, my experience is you need to do a little bit more creative explanation. Mm -hmm. um, someone may look and say, well, that preschooler is not really like reading yet, but I think the pre-reading skills that you're doing with early Braille, to me, that seems like a very reasonable justification. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing though. You're right, by the way. And for traditional funding, that's absolutely, you know, the kind of the way of things that we have to think about how we're justifying things. But with funds like ARPA, it is in many respects easier. The kind of conversations that we are having with school districts in some of the Western states, they seem to be a little bit ahead of the East uh, in terms of getting the money to the districts already, is that we are, we're not necessarily, so we, the conversation is something like this, and I'm paraphrasing. We're speaking to a TVI and we say, so how many students do you have in your district or under your caseload who are blind or low vision? And they say, 10 students who are blind, 25 who are low vision. Okay. The kind of proposal that we're putting together is we're assuming that every blind student reads Braille. I realize that that is not always the case, but we are assuming for the purposes of a proposal that they do. And the proposal will include, in fact, either a number of Braille embosses, we come up with some kind of ratio of how many embosses we think will be necessary for that number of students and how much curriculum needs to be printed. Uh, refreshable Braille displays. There are other Braille typewriter products out there, certainly for beginning Braille readers uh, to help with that. So it's not just thinking about what do I do to get me through the next six months. I think in the case of a young student, you know, thinking about their education career and what is that what are the students needs going to be over the next five or six years it's totally appropriate so you can absolutely think that way we've also had conversations with some districts where we're no longer thinking about individual braille printers which is the more common thing that we were selling but really thinking about production embosses i'm talking about an embosser that can print a double-sided page of braille in like you know five or 10 seconds, it's like super fast. Uh, you wouldn't get one of those for a preschooler, but you might get one of those for your entire district so that you can actually take all of your electronic school curriculum and convert it into hard copy braille, if indeed that was an appropriate way to, uh, to do it. 
the question is, if you use a braille display, do you think the school still needs a braille printer? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think the thing that a braille printer is going to give you, depending on the model that you buy, is the ability to produce graphics in braille, math in braille, you know, certain, certain things in Braille aren't necessarily confined to one line, which is what a Braille display does. I, I think that both is appropriate. Uh, I, I would think of this the same way that I think about having a printer in my home office. I don't print every single thing that I get electronically. I mean, most of the things that I get, I get an email, I look at it on a screen, and that's good enough. And for something that I'm just kind of skimming over, that's great. But if there's something that I really need to kind of study, it has more detail, certainly something that's newer material that I've not seen before, sometimes having that in, in hard copy is, uh, is, is better for me. And the same can be true for Braille. Uh, the other thing that you can do with Braille, of course, is if you are presenting a series of facts, you know, I mean, your average Braille, Braille piece of paper is, what, 40 characters wide by what is it, 15, 20, 20 lines of Braille to an average page if you're using regular Braille paper. Um, so being able to kind of see all of that on a single page rather than panning through with a Braille display is, um, is also going to be a good thing. So there was, there was a, a question yeah. a little higher up, I think, one for you, one for me. Mm. Um, for you, do you know if with this funding, if the products purchased, do they stay with the child or with the school? That's a great question. Usually with state funding, the, the product stays with the school district. And, and that is because the, typically when the child is leaving K-12 education and going on into, hopefully going on into a college environment, that's where they qualify for services with the Department of Vocational Rehab. In the case of Massachusetts, that's the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. If you live in a different state, the name of your voc rehab may have a different name. I know that it's the Texas Workforce Commission in Texas, for example, and it's straightforward Department of Rehab in California. So the name will vary, but the, but the, the idea in terms of how people are funded and served and supported outside of school is usually, usually through that department. And then there was a question about job opportunities for people with low vision who also have intellectual disabilities. Um, I can answer specifically for Massachusetts, which is that there is um, support from the state for people who have multiple disabilities. I expect that that is true in every state. It may just vary with how experienced different programs are. Um, I have found in my experience that if there's both vision as well as another disability, people tend to get served by kind of the overarching like um, commission for the blind. If they don't have the vision issue, then they may go through just a general department of rehab services. Uh, but there are usually teams within each state agency that are focused on people who have multiple disabilities. So perhaps that's deaf blind services or that is services for people who have these multiple disabilities. Um, someone mentioned it's true in Texas. So I, my, I, I don't want to say 100% every state will have specialists in people with multiple disabilities. But yes, people who have both developmental disabilities as well as low vision do receive services as well as the vocational support um, and the ability to obtain devices for work goals and independent living. It's uh, the, same, the same rules apply and it's all based on that individual's goals and needs with what they're provided. So there is a question about training and whether the ARPA fund uh, can be used for a training instruction of assistive technology products. The answer is yes. Uh, certainly the proposals that we've been working on with, uh, with districts in other parts of the country uh, are including such things. So professional development for teachers um, is, is key. We want to make sure these products are used effectively. And so, yes, it is covered. Any other questions that people have? Um, also, even going back to some of the cases, if, if you have questions about how those were managed or handled, but um, okay. So can the request be for equipment that a school needs to have year after year for students with visual impairment rather than equipment for specific students? 
That's a great question. And, and I don't know that I can tell you 100% that what I'm about to say is accurate. But what I think the answer is here, I mean, can I come along and say, I want to get 30 Braille displays so I have enough for all of my incoming blind students that join me next year and the year after that and the year after that? I think the answer is probably you can't do that. I think you, you basically say, look, I have 25 students in my caseload today. What can I get for those 25 students? So it's reasonable for you to say that I want to get 25 of each product. So I want to get 25 Braille displays. I want to get 25 embosses. I want to get 25 uh, talking book players and whatever else it is that you think is necessary and to have those. I mean, whether every student that you have starts using those, I don't know. But once you've got those products, of course, I mean, students come in and out of school districts all the time, especially in some districts where you have a transient population. This is common in states like Florida, for example, um, where, you know, when that student leaves, again, the product doesn't go with them. So it seems to me that, you know, you could still kind of get around that. But don't forget, ARPA, those funds can be used through the year 2024. Um, so at least for the next three years, well, including this year, so the next two and a half years from today, uh, there's going to be money around for you to do this. So as your, as your caseload comes along and you know what you're going to be dealing with, I will be putting in my requests. But I think that, you know, planning is key here and just having something that you can kind of take to your administrator, I'd say, along with a copy of the, of the kind of the ARPA brochure that we produce, taking that with a proposal, providing it to the administrator. I mean, sometimes we speak with the administrators. It just all depends on the school district and how they want to handle it. And, uh, you know, we can, we can certainly put together something that will make sense um, and something that isn't as short-lived as the next six months. Question there, do you involve parents of children in trainings? Um, well, I, I haven't been involved in any in a while. I will tell you where I've personally been involved in trainings in public education. Certainly there have been times when parents have come along and sat in. I mean, once we're training, I mean, whether we're, I mean, there is a, there is a, a limit ultimately. Probably you wouldn't want more than, you know, 10 or 12 people in a given training. And especially when we're talking about hardware products for someone who's blind, those trainings are usually one device per person that's in the training. So, you know, if we have 10 Braille products, it's going to be, you might have a couple of people doubling up. Um, but if you don't have a device, it's kind of hard to learn how to use them, I would say. So, uh, but to the extent there's an available device and to the extent the school doesn't mind, uh, I would say it's, it should be uh, a reasonable accommodation. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah, and, and similar in my clinical exams, you know, we obviously want the individual who's going to be using the tool to learn to use it, but we include parents if we're working with children um, on our, in our assessments. And um, I think vision teachers that I have worked with will engage the parents because the parents need to do some reinforcement at home in many cases. Uh, the parents aren't typically in the classroom on every single school day. A lot of that is the individual child, but I think um, depending on the age, depending on the child's ability, there, there will be different integration uh, but we do, we bring parents into our exams for our assessments and really engage the parents as well, uh, just so they see how their child is performing and they can help reinforce if necessary. Uh, but it, it all depends on the age and the particular family dynamics. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I haven't seen anything else come through. Okay, I'm guessing not. Well, suffice to say that if anyone does uh, come up with other questions, uh, you can certainly uh, communicate with APH, who will in turn communicate with Dr. Malkin and myself. Uh, you can also go to the humanware.com website and uh, there's a contact us page with our contact information. You can go there as well. And, uh, you know, people in my team, again, we have a number of specialists who will be more than happy to answer questions. Uh, and uh, other than that, I don't think we have anything else to add to this topic other than to thank everyone for coming along and listening to us this afternoon. Thank you.